Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Richard Sachs, Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs at the University of Rio Grande and Rio Grande Community College. I welcome you to the Voice of Rio Grande this afternoon. And I'm delighted to have with me Dr. Jackson Connor, who's an Assistant Professor of English here and also the English Coordinator, meaning that he schedules classes and um, hires adjuncts and does a number of other things. Welcome, Dr. Connor. Thank you, Dr. Sykes. It's great uh, to be here. Good. Um, now, as an academic, I'm going to ask about your academic background. I know you've told me you grew up in Western PA, and your bachelor's degree is from Penn State, Barron, the Barron campus, which I've seen on maps, but I've never actually gone to. And it seems like you're right by that Presque Isle area in a really pretty part of Erie. But I notice on your CV you say it's Wesleyville, PA, and so it's not actually in Erie. I always kind of thought it was. That's absolutely true. It is in Wesleyville, but most people call the campus Penn State Erie or Penn State Barron. Um, one of the great things about the Penn State Barron campus is similar to the University of Rio Grande. The Barron campus was originally donated by the Barron family. It was a farm. Uh, we have actually that branch campus is geographically larger than the Penn State main campus. There are several hundred acres. There's wow. a gorge and a stream on the campus. It's a beautiful campus. Wow, mm -hmm. wow, that's great. Now, um, I know I grew up wanting to be an attorney, and then when I was 14, I, I was reading a novel that I don't need to talk about, and I was so entranced by it that I suddenly decided I'm going to be a novelist. So yes. when I went to college, yeah. I thought, well, I better get an English degree because my mom will kill me if I just go out and try to try to write a novel. So that's how I ended up being an English major. How did you end up deciding you wanted an English literature degree from Penn State Barron? It was a very similar <laughs> process in discovering a, a novel, or in this case, a series of vignettes. It was Tim O'Brien's oh. The Things They Carried. Oh, my word. It was okay. one of the first novels I ever read cover to cover, and that was when I was a sophomore in college. I hadn't read much before that. Uh, at that time, I was a math major. Really? Recently uh, changed my major from engineering. And uh, I read this book, and it just struck me as one of the most compelling, fascinating stories I'd ever read. I wasn't particularly interested in war stories or yeah. Vietnam war stories, but the way that it was written was stunning and still is. It's, uh, wow. it's definitely on my list of Desert Island books. Thank you for sharing yeah. that with us. Um, I've taught the things they carried twice, mm -hmm. either in courses on the 60s or once a course on the Vietnam War. And I can honestly say if our reading audience hasn't read it, they need to read both the title story and all. Actually, um, and this is an interesting question to ask, um, each story really stands on its own. Yes. But you're referring to it as a novel, and most people do refer to it as a novel. Yes. Um, but it's an interesting point. I mean, some collections of short stories you can read as a novel, and some you really can't. And that one you can. And I would recommend to anybody who wants an experience of the Vietnam War, and I'm not going to ruin the story, I think, by telling you the title, but as various members of this young man's unit dies, he describes the things that they carried. And, you know, w love letters to... You, you know, a, a, a lucky rock or, you know, all the various things, and then you realize what's important. Um, and at times, like, when I've been in, like, a bad car accident or something, and I think, oh, my God, I have this note from a professor at the conference with her female name on it and her phone number. And, like, if I had died in this, my wife would have thought, like, what the heck is this? But it's just for a reference in an article I'm going to write. So this, uh, the whole idea of the things they carry, what's on your person is, is a fascinating point. Thank you for sharing yes, that with absolutely. me. Yes, absolutely. As a lit prof, I find that very moving. Yeah. And then you went on and got a master's degree at University of Utah. And it was with a focus in creative writing. And even though, as academics, we understand the difference between an MA and an MS and an MFA, some people get MAs in English. You got an MFA in English. Can you talk to us a little bit about the fine arts degree and, and what you did for your master's degree? Absolutely. So at the university where I got my master's degree, uh, the MA and the MFA, all the coursework was done together, along with the PhD candidates. The major distinction was that the MA candidates eventually wrote a thesis that was uh, critical in nature, where they would examine uh, literature or a writer's life or some other piece of art. Uh, whereas with the Master of Fine Arts, my thesis was a creative endeavor. 
Now, of course, with any creative endeavor at that level, we also had to have a critical appreciation of our own work and a critical appreciation of the background into which that work fit. So I took a number of literature courses and literary theory courses, semiotics, and I, I can talk about structuralism and post-structuralism and all kinds of other things that are terribly uninteresting unless you go deep enough. But that was the major distinction. No, I was in Ann Arbor in the, seven, in the 80s and I don't want to hear anything else about semiotics or Jacques Lacan and I do not use Deridian as, oh, no. a, as an adjective. Oh no. <laughs> okay. Oh. That was very Deridian. We're gonna you. need another. <laughs> we're gonna need another episode. Oh, oh are we? Okay. Or maybe I need to reread. Uh, what is it? Of grammatology. Oh, I, th I think, I think it's, it might be on grammatology. Uh, but on grammatology. Yeah, split hairs. Uh, it's thirty years ago. <laughs> I'm surprised I remember that much. But um, and you were at University of Utah, which of course has a good reputation for their graduate English. But were there other things pulling you to Salt Lake City from Pennsylvania? Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Of course, um, <clears throat> mostly geography. Uh, shortly after I discovered the things they carried, uh, my immediate impulse is I, should, I felt as though I should drop out of college. And so I did. And uh, I didn't have much to do, so a friend of mine asked me to go snowboarding out west with him. And we ended up living in a car and traveling around the west. And we drove through Utah. And it was the most striking place beautiful. on earth. It has every geographical landscape imaginable, uh, canyons, mountains, valleys, plains, deserts, uh, grasslands, farmlands, has cities and so forth. I knew I needed to get back there. Okay. And I, I, as much as I love growing up in western Pennsylvania, I knew that what I really needed was to get back to the west for my grad program. And there were 14 ski resorts within 45 minutes All right. of the All University right. of Utah. So I've skied Park City mm -hmm. and um, what is... Um, What's the classy place? Alto. Uh, no, not Alto. Sundance. Um, no, right next to Park City, um, across the way. Okay, I'll, yeah. I'll remember it later. Mm -hmm. um, Alto is very weird because it's just skiing. Yes. There's no snowboards. No snowboarding. And it's mostly like, it's almost like um, boarding houses where, you, where you're provided food. It doesn't have the classic after ski stuff and uh, my older brother loves skiing Alta with me because right. we just skied our brains out all day sure and then ate dinner at night went to bed and skied the next day unlike all the opera ski stuff well that's fascinating and then what brought you back to Ohio and your doctoral work at Ohio University in Athens uh, a, a number of issues uh, the, the, the primary thing that I always considered when I was applying to any grad program was do I think that I can write in this place and I, I I knew that I could write in Western Pennsylvania, and I, I knew that I wrote well out in the West, uh, and I, I, I felt as though I could write well in Southeastern Ohio and be close to my family, which was important to me as well. Uh, I applied to five PhD programs, um, hoping to get into one of them, and unfortunately I got into all five, so I had to then make the decision, sure. what do I do at this point? Uh, <coughs> It, and it was a combination of things at that point. Uh, I had a family by that time, and we wanted to move back to the east. Uh, I also was accepted at, at the southern Mississippi in Hattiesburg, and we decided not to move south, and we decided not to go to Oregon, and we decided not to go to uh, a larger city again. Okay. So that's what led us to southeastern Ohio okay. at first. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, and again, a lot of your background is creative writing. I assume your dissertation in the mountains shall labor and bring forth that is that is a creative work. Yes. And your master's thesis, I'll tell the mill, is also. Are, are these short stories or a short novel or what? Uh, uh, I'll, I'll tell the mill was at that time uh, about 220 page novel. Okay. Uh, about a steel mill that I worked in during my undergraduate career. I, I worked at a place called Franklin Industry Steel Mill. Um, over the summer I worked 70 hour weeks and wow. uh, it's mandatory overtime yeah. and for those of you who aren't familiar with that term congratulations <laughs> uh, it's it was it was pretty off when it was a it was a facet of life that was in stark contrast to my academic side where I was spending 70 80 hours a week writing poetry and sure. <laughs> reading poetry and acting like a poet, yeah. uh, the steel mill was a very hard place. And then the, the other, the, my friend dissertation I was writing about uh, 
an experience I had. I, I also worked for Mason for a year after my undergraduate program as a hod slinger or hottie. So that's a stonemason, so, mm -hmm. so you're preparing mortar and yes. stuff like that? Mm -hmm. Sure. Mostly carrying stuff and looking okay. mean. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> right. okay. Well, it's an interesting point because even though I'm a big guy and I played sports in college and things like that, um, I've always considered myself an intellectual and a writer and a, and a teacher. And I remember once years ago when I had to, uh, I had a sledgehammer and I had to tear up um, a dry bar in a basement. Mm -hmm. And for two hours I'm slinging and slinging and then taking the stuff out to the curb and I'm looking and my muscles are bulging. Huh. And then I went upstairs to grade papers. I shower, I feel good, make some coffee, and I couldn't grab the pen. Yeah. It hurt to grab the pen because I had been slamming the sledgehammer for two hours and suddenly I got a view of an outside looking in that it's not comfortable to hold a pen when you've been slinging a sledgehammer for two hours, yeah. which I'd never done again before or after. And it gave me an interesting insight into the fact that, yeah, I'm a sweet boy with soft hands, you know, and and it, it's a different dynamic. Yes. But um, I love things like the poetry of Gary Snyder where he has such an appreciation for work, or in one book he calls the real work, the right. real work of whatever it's doing, sweeping the floor, or, you know, making a table or whatever else it is. Right. Um, but tell me about the fact that much of your life has been writing creatively, yet most of your teaching is in what we call comp and rhetoric, composition and rhetoric. And again, this is a loaded question because at all five of the institutions I've been at over the last 35 years, I would say often one third to one half of my comp instructors, often my best ones, are originally creative writers. Mm -hmm. So can you talk about the interplay of that? Because on the one hand, it's very different writing a poem or writing a short story and teaching composition pedagogy. But on the other hand, it really seems to fit in nicely. Can you talk about your experience in doing that? Uh, yeah, I think so. Uh, my my first and probably most generic response to that would be that no, no matter what you're teaching or what you're creating, writing is writing. I teach a lot of the same lessons or I have taught in my creative writing classes that I teach in my composition classes. Um, the bottom line for every single document you create is knowing who your audience is and what your purpose is. Why are you writing this and who are you writing to? You need to know those things whether you are Tim O'Brien writing the things they carried or uh, Jackson Connor writing for a blog or uh, whether you're writing for an instructor or a group of peers, whether you're presenting a, writing for a grant application, whoever, who, whatever you're writing, you need to know who your audience is. You need to know what your purpose is. You also need to work on your concrete and specific details. I think that probably the greatest indication of an, the early stages of a writer is a reliance on generalization an abstraction rather than focusing on concrete and specific details. Sure. Now, I've noticed one of the courses you've taught in the past is called The Rise of the Novel. Yeah. And I know two of my favorite courses in college were The Rise of the Novel and then The Development of the Novel. Now, at the college I went to, they defined The Rise of the Novel as the 18th century British novel. Huh. And then The Development of the Novel was the 19th century novel throughout Europe mostly. Yeah. Um, it, do you accept that? that um, uh, Not at all. Uh, oh, okay, well, well, <laughs> well tell us. Let, let's have a good literary discussion. Um, uh, the rise of the novel uh, is the rise of American literature. Oh, okay. Uh, I think that it certainly began, you can trace it to, to England, and right. certainly you can say that uh, novels like Samuel Johnson's novels, and, no, I'm sorry, he's the playwright. Yeah. yeah. Um, Richard, um, uh, Richardson. Defoe, Defoe Richardson, Richardson, Fielding. Yes, yeah, yeah, thank yeah, you. Those are the, the big three. 18th century. Yeah, uh, I mean, you can novels. point to them. Um, we, or you could point as far back as Rabelais, or you could point even farther back than that. And I, I think you could make an argument for Gilgamesh, or okay. uh, you know the 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 big Greek writers. So these writers. are lengthy narratives. Oh, absolutely. That, that, that look like a novel. That when look thick. Yeah. Now the right. the distinction here between those early novels, whether they are romantic, not romantic novels, long books, or whether they are uh, Greek epics. 
The distinction between those and the novel is a sense of individualism and the rise of the individual as a character. Uh, it's a constant move away from the timeless and unchanging gods and deities and Hercules and the events from our past that are set in stone, unchangeable, unchanging. And into a moment where what happened to you last Tuesday suddenly becomes the point of focus for an entire plot, a whole dynamic. So it's like the privacy of the individual that yes. uh, comes in with the novel. Can't um, do it without America. Right, yeah. there you go. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to take a brief break. This is Dr. Richard Sachs with my guest today, Dr. Jackson Connor. Please stay tuned and we'll be right back with you. Was that too patriotic? No. no, no. Welcome back. This is Dr. Richard Sachs with my guest, Dr. Jackson Connor, and we're discussing um, his background, uh, his educational background, his teaching background, and some of the courses he's taught. And I've looked over some of your nonfiction. I love all the titles. There's no way I can mention all of them. But I noticed one is called Hello, Governor Romney. Yes. Do you want to talk about that at all? Because it seems like that might have occurred during the uh, yes. presidential election. Uh, I, I don't want to talk about it, but I will. Okay. Um, that, Sorry. That was a... Uh, uh, I, I, I would, I w the main reason I would want to talk about that is because this was an opportunity where I, I took a real world situation and used my creative writing experience and, and focused some of the things that I had developing. It was a particularly, you know, in terms of knowing your audience, it was in response to something that Governor Romney had said on the campaign trail that uh, where he said that we're, I'm not reaching out to, to the 47 percent of the country. Uh, I don't represent them. And it was a strange feeling to think that if you're running for president, you, you're going to be representing us all. Right. And it was a rare time that I have used my experience as a writer in a, a, a more social role. And, I, and I, it was more public than I am accustomed to uh, writing, uh, most literary writing if you're lucky, 500 people read what you've sure, written, sure. and most of them are your parents. And uh, this was an opportunity where hundreds, perhaps thousands of people had their eyes on uh, something that I had written. Well, that raises a fascinating question. I'd love to go a little philosophical and hear your thoughts on this. Um, when writers write, and as a lit professor for over 30 years, I often engage in discussion with students and I have some students who say um, you know what's the message here especially when there might be a political or a social math message dealing with some so big social issue of the day or or something else political like this um, I know other people and I've talked to other people who say you know there's a political bent to everything you do so even if I don't know that, I don't know, you're a liberal left-wing Democrat or you're a conservative Republican. It'll come out in your art anyway, and I'll be able to see that. Um, I know there are some literary critics who say, if you have a strong political message, then it can't be great art. And there are other people who say, well, no, look at Hemingway's For Whom the Bell Tolls. That, that's you know a fictional rendering of the Spanish Civil War, and look at all the insights we get about that situation. So where do you stand on that, especially when you teach creative writing and you're trying to train the next generation of creative writers? How do you balance political view with artistic quality? So, sorry, I, I, I just thought of that question, and I know it's a huge loaded question. Yeah, that's a big one. Uh, um, um, it, uh, well, I, I, I would deal with it in, in multiple ways, depending on what hat I'm wearing on any given day. As a reader of uh, literature, I try to avoid the authorial fallacy, which is I, I try not to look at a piece of art or a piece of writing and say, oh, now I understand who uh, Hemingway really was. So the question of our authorial intention yeah. you think is irrelevant? That's correct. Like, how can we figure out their intention? Right. They're not I'm, here. I'm a new okay. critic. And oh, okay. As far, okay. As, as far as that goes, where I, I, I focus primarily on the language, close reading the text, I'm most interested in the nouns and the verbs, rather than what it was that Hemingway had set out to. Was he a, opposed to the war, or was he a, you know, a violent misogynist, or was yeah. he uh, just a, in love with boxing and his dogs? I don't know. Yeah. Uh, 
from the stance of a writer. Um, uh, her name is on the tip of my tongue. She wrote The Colonel, uh, no, Carolyn Forche, okay. uh, has a beautiful poem called The Colonel, and I can't think of the title of the collection that that's in, but it is an often anthologized piece, and I think she has the best bit of advice for anybody who wants to be a political writer, and she says, if you want to be a political writer, be political. And so, right on the politics page, not on the literary page. Right. Okay. Yeah, and and she put her money where her mouth was. She was writing about uh, Cuba in the 1950s and 60s, and so she went to Cuba, and she wrote about that. And her poetry is uh, beautiful and violent, and uh, she immersed herself in the culture about what she's writing, which always points back to the the bottom line in creative writing, which is write what you know. Yeah. And so, yeah, I guess that's basically it. Uh, if you want to write political things, get involved in politics. Okay. If you want to write about the steel mill, spend some time yeah. in the steel mill. So again, I see a lot of your life being represented in what you just said about write what you know. Yeah. Um, so I have to ask the question, this is a version of the American Bandstand question that Dick Clark always used to ask the band. He'd say, did you start with the music or did you start with the lyrics? <laughs> so I'll, I'll ask a similar type of question, and that is, when you are motivated to create a new work of short fiction or a work of poetry, um, is it the observation or is it sometimes the language that comes to you first? Or, or, or do you just, for example, find a fascinating character that you either see or, or imagine and then think, I have to put that person in the kind of story that would bring out what I see as the important characteristics. So I, I guess what I'm really asking, we only have a few minutes left and this is worth hours, is how do you take a creative spark and put it to paper? And how much intention is there and how much is it just you're trying to create a work of art? And, and Dr. Connor did reference New Criticism, Alan Tate, John Crow Ransom, uh, arguing that don't worry about the context. What is the quality of language? What's the quality of characterization? You know, things like that. How does it stand as a work of art? Is, is that a good summary of <laughs> New Criticism rather than talking about context and influence right. and things like that? Absolutely. So, um, uh, where do you go with that artistic inspiration? Because inspiration doesn't happen that much. Some days you wake up and you have to write, there's no inspiration. So how do you get pen to paper in that situation? Well, um, that is a very long answer. Uh, one of my favorite writers of all time is definitely William Faulkner. He, uh, Sound of the Fury was the first novel I ever read without being required to read it. And if you've read it, it's a very convoluted, difficult Amazing. story. But it, but it was the language of it that I didn't understand yeah. what was happening in the book, but the, just the language moved me through it. Um, and, 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 and for those of you who don't know, the Sound of the Fury is a story told four times, but the first time it's told by Benji, and he's mentally retarded. And so you deal with that for the first 90 pages. And then there's Jason Thompson, there's Dilsey. And I forgot who the fourth narrator Quentin. is. Quentin, well, Quentin Dilsey's Thompson, the yeah. fourth narrator. Yeah, yeah. Quentin goes second, then and Jason. And Dilsey's probably the best narrator, yeah. I think, in terms, uh, of, in, in terms of reliability. or. Oh, yeah, in terms yeah. of reliability, okay. absolutely. In yeah. terms of the language, it's either Benji or Quentin. Yeah. Um, the, the, the reason I mentioned Faulkner at all is because an interviewer asked him one time, do you write every day or only when you're inspired? And his response was, I'm inspired every day. <laughs> and it, it sounds lovely and brilliant, but the truth is he, there's, it's very hard to disentangle those two things. And it's entirely likely, and I like to think, that he was inspired every day because he sat down every day. Right. And he wrote every day. And I absolutely swear by a sustained, consistent effort is... Uh, the key to success as any kind of writer, but absolutely as a poet, as a nonfictionist, as a fictionist, novelist. Uh, the, the stretches of time when I have been most successful have not been the times when I have been doing the most interesting things of my life or when I have felt a, moved by a statue or an event. It's the times in my life when I have been sitting down on a daily basis and either hitting the keyboard or just moving that pen across the paper. 
Well, we only have a few seconds left, but how do you compose? Do you like to compose longhand, or do you compose at the computer now? Yes. Or, yeah, you do? Yeah, and, almost and, exclusively. And have you always done that, or, no. or did the transition have to come? Uh, I, I think probably the, the best writing of my life came from a word processor where you, it was very similar to a typewriter, except sure. you could see a few lines and then hit print and it would type them all out. Right. And, but now it's exclusively a computer. Okay, great. Yeah. Okay, well, we're at the end of our time. I've had a fascinating time talking with you, and I, I wish we had more time. But again, um, I'm happy to have uh, welcomed Dr. Jackson Connor as a guest this afternoon. Uh, this is Dr. Richard Sachs. We're at uh, University of Rio Grande and Rio Grande Community College in beautiful southeastern Ohio. And you should come uh, see our campus and take courses from us from wonderful young professors like Professor Connor here. Thanks very much and have a good week. Thanks, Dr. Sachs.